G'day, it's absolutely uh, brilliantly freezing and cold day in Kyneton again and Charlie and I are uh, tucked away in the studio finally completing this studio session that I promised a little while back. Um, you may realise, uh, notice that I'm wearing a ridiculous German hunting jacket and you might also realise, which is a clue by the way to the wines, but you might also notice that I'm holding a rather nice looking bass guitar, a different one to the one I had last time we showed off an instrument. The connection being that last time we talked about Jaco Pistorius and fretless bass and a Fender jazz bass, well that bass was of course designed by Leo Fender and when Leo Fender sold his company back in the day, he had a band slapped on him for 10 years whereby he couldn't do much. When he re-emerged, he invented this, which is the Music Man Stingray, um, loosely modelled on the Fender Precision Bass, but with a scratch plate that unkindly gets called the toilet seat, and also the odd head shape with three plus one to distinguish it as a Music Man. This became the go-to instrument for many wonderful bass players, players who are way more wonderful than I am on this instrument, but it has a beautiful, clean sound. It's silky smooth to play. Better than that. Um, and it's just a lovely tool, and I have it as my four-string in an imaginary world where, where I record another album, ah, that would be the day, uh, this would be the four string bass I would use, the four string fretted. It's a lovely piece of kit. Um, but as usual, we're not really here to talk about instruments, so let's talk about wine. And the wines we're going to talk about today are the Huber wines from Baden in Germany, Pinot Noir from Germany. Not talking about Riesling today, talking about Burgundian varieties, namely Pinot Noir, which they call Spät Burgunder, uh, Chardonnay and a bit of Pinot Blanc. Um, the Huber estate, uh, it's been written many times and it continues to be written, uh, uh, the producer of the great Pinot Noirs out of Germany. Now, uh, back in the day, we had a go, I don't know if people will remember this, at importing Pinot Noir from Germany back in the very first couple of years of Sellerhand. We worked with a guy called Joachim Hager in Baden, Dr. Hager was the label, and imported wines for a couple of years and it was really heavy going, I have to say. The market was in a diff very different place to what it is now. And to be honest, we couldn't give them away. So we gave them away. Fast forwarding a decade or so, we thought, well, come on. If we're supposed to be fair dinkum importers of German, German wines, Pinot Noir, Spätburgunder has been part of the equation for a long time, like 700 years a long time. So we thought, well, let's find out what's going on. Made a few calls had a few good friends in Germany, obviously, and the unanimous word was that Bernard Huber in the village of Malterdinger was the guy. So we made contact, uh, we arranged a visit, we went to see him, and the phrase blown away gets used a lot in wine, doesn't it? I was blown away. It was a fantastic visit. We went to visit Bernard a few times after that. Unfortunately, he passed away a few years ago, but not before he was able to do a very, uh, what must have been surreal, handover for a couple of years to his son Julian, who's going to make the wines going forward, and he's doing a fantastic job. The wines we're going to look at today are full set from 2015. Uh, we've got an offer in play on these at the moment, and we're going to go through the wines one by one, and rather than uh, me do tasting notes on them, I'm going to make a bunch of statements about the wines. So the first vine is the Weisse Burgunder, or Pinot Blanc, uh, which effectively, if you want to use a French uh, comparison, is the Bourgogne Blanc of the estate. Uh, Ikem, who is the assistant winemaker, great name, that is her name, Ikem, and Julian uh, really want to edge the, everything about the estate forward. And 2015 was the first year that they started to be able to have input into that. Um, so here, I'm going to read off my screen because I wrote down things to talk about as statements when we were tasting through the wines. White chocolate, vanilla spice. Mouth-watering lemon acidity. Hay, straw, all kinds of yellow grasses. Kaffir lime leaf, why is this? Is this Chardonnay? Waxy, mealy, really good buttery. And would appeal to drinkers of 
and wait for the list, Chardonnay, Riesling, Semillon, Sauvignon Blanc, Pinot Gris, and an underrated variety for sure. So a lovely, uh, minerally, medium bodied, you sort of think it's in the Chardonnay camp, but you're not sure, textural, waxy introduction to the Huber wines. A lot of people think about Pinot Blanc, of course, as being in that sort of aromatic Pinot Gris Riesling sort of spectrum. It's not. It's actually from the Chardonnay side of things, genetically. This is a really good example, and going forwards becomes the entry level white into the Huber range. It's delicious. I think the price is on screen somewhere here. I can't remember. Charlie will whiz them in later. The next wine is called Alta Raven. It doesn't even have the word Chardonnay on the label, but I can guarantee you it is. And it's the sister wine, or the brother and sister wine, to the Alta Raven Pinot Noir, which we'll talk of in a little while. Um, this was the wine that, um, I guess in Bernard's days, we were most reticent to import insofar as it was a very well-made Chardonnay always, but that was the thing. It always looked like it was made. It always looked like it had a lot of winemaking artifacts. There was a lot of oak. There was a lot of concentration in power and minerality, but it just looked a bit try-hard. Not so now. These days, the old vine Chardonnay is, it just has the right amount of everything. It's more taut, but not less flavoursome, if you know what I mean. It's got the flavour and the power, but it's got a chiselled mineralic, is that a word, mineralic? That's wrong with it, aspect as well. It's smoky, yes, from lees and from oak, but in a good way, just in like the right amount of it. It's lengthy, it's got a lot of flavour persistence, but not a whole lot of oak in that persistence. Very charming. And I would say, if it's a burgundy comparison, you're thinking about Chasson Montrachet as a flavour spectrum. Now, I don't mean to crap on all the time about the burgundy comparisons, but it is worth noting this. If you're in Maltedingen, in the village where these guys are, you're working largely with a soil profile called mussel chalk. And that is effectively the same limestone soil as you'll find in places like Chambon Mazzini. Fossilised limestone. You're three hours away by car, two hours if you're running late for an appointment. Um, very similar <coughs> climate, very similar terroir. And this is the reason why, I guess, back in the day, the Cistercian monks discovered this region and planted seven, eight hundred years ago Pinot Noir and Chardonnay back in those days. So yeah, bloody interesting Chardonnay from Germany, Alta Raven, Cuba. The next one in the lineup is the Maltedinger Spätburgunder. But again, being modern thinking, They've done away with words like Spätburg under on the label. It just says Maltedinger. And really what they're wanting to get to is have this as a village level, whereby you associate it with being from a particular village, in this case Maltedinger, and from a particular producer. Um, I only made three statements about this wine. One was that it's eminently slurpable. Got to be a good thing these days. Two, very pure, clean, bright and crunchy. No Britannomyces here, I can tell you. No too much oak, no too much alcohol, just everything in its right spot. And I said, again, to draw the comparison, like a good village wine from a Chambol producer. Uh, delicious. I think the 15 is about to sell out, but we've actually got 16 and possibly 17, but definitely 16 already here, or one of the two. Jaffe will tell us. Maltedinger Pinot. Next wine is the Alta Raven Pinot, Spätburgunder. Um, here you're talking about vines at a minimum 40 years old, and you're talking about 35-40% whole bunches in the fermentation. And you're also, conveniently enough, talking about about one third new oak barrels used. Um, Bernard Huber did his tutelage, as it were, did his training with a good friend called Jacques Cesse at Domaine du Jacques in Burgundy, of all places good friend of the farce, funnily enough. So it's funny how all these great people came together. Um, and I guess what uh, the Cess family showed uh, Bernard Hoover back in the day was that juggling, that marriage of oak, whole bunches, not when it's not appropriate, yes when it is, using it judiciously. And it's fair to say it took him a while to get that really down pat, if you pardon the pun, uh, 
But he got well and truly there towards the end of his wine growing career, wine making career, and Julian and Ikem making the wines now are definitely there. Uh, this is a real charmer in the glass. It's definitely more pure and sort of less ethereal and secondary than the other three wines that we're going to look at shortly. Um, but it's nonetheless for it. It's intended for that earlier drinking, you know, five, six, seven years earlier drinking. But from a restaurant perspective, it's probably one of the picks in terms of the sweet spot LUC wise, uh, the sweet spot on a retail shelf. Um, deeply coloured, quite imposing in the glass, but a lot of those lovely strawberry fruit notes, but more like strawberry conserve, concentrated, really uh, dense but light on his feet at the same time. Love this wine year in, year out. The 2015 version, utterly charming. It's the Alta Raven. Next wine in the lineup is one of the GGs or Grosses Gewerk Grand Cru level of German Pinot Noir. This is one called Schlossberg. And yes, you've heard that name before uh, in Alsace, Schlossberg, Breuerberg Schlossberg in the Rheingau. This one is Hecklinger Schlossberg from Huber. And Schloss, of course, means castle, and Berg means hill or mountain. And it's to signify on the steep, steep uh, terrace where this vineyard is, big old castle, hence calling it Schlossberg. Um, now, rather than a statement from me on this, and I could make plenty, uh, I'm going to read one because there was a ripper uh, in uh, the top 100 James Suckling wines. Uh, 2018, I think this was. It says, hold on to your hat. This is, sorry, this is Stuart Piggott writing on the way to giving the wine 98 points. Hold on to your hat because here comes the most amazing Pinot Noir bottled in Germany during modern times. Now, if you know Stuart Piggott, like I do, um, this is not a guy who uh, gives out that sort of statement willy-nilly. He's got a meaner and he was deadly serious. He goes on. The blackest berries you can imagine are the main feature on the nose, but it's still so delicate and lacking any trace of over overripeness. Now again, that gives a clue to what, I, what I'm getting at here insofar as they've really started to knuckle down and nail the wines in a terroir-driven sort of way. He goes on. The interplay of concentrated fruits, superfine tannins, creates an enveloping impression on the palate, uh, then on the finish, the seamless harmony extends in the direction of eternity. Sorry, what? Extends in the direction of eternity. Well, wow. you could drink this now, but the 2009 is still youthful, and that gives you an idea of the aging potential. So, yes, yeah, certainly, here you're talking about, you know, one of the best Pinot Noirs that's ever been made in Germany. That's a big call. I think we've still got some of it left, I'm not sure, but I think we do. Um, yeah, get, get your lips around this would be my tip if you want an absolute high-end Pinot Noir for home, for the list, for the shelf in your wine store. Just run, don't walk, get there, buy some of this wine. The final two wines in the lineup I like to talk about as a pair because effectively they come from the same vineyard. The Bienenberg Grand Cru, uh, Bienenberg being the Bees Mountain, and the Wildenstein, the wild stone subclimat, I guess you'd say, within the Bienenberg Grand Cru. So Bernard always wanted to keep this particular parcel separate from the main wine, um, not necessarily on the basis of a qualitative assessment, just because this had a wild, mineralic, individual character. Um, Bienenberg is probably, in terms of the Huber range, the Schlossberg gets the, gets the uh, accolades, and I guess that's partly because it's a more famous sounding site at, at its very core. Uh, but these two are something special. Let's have a close look at them. So the Bienenberg um, is just stunning. It's concentrated, and again, it gets into that bright cherry ripeness. Really pure, almost piercing in its focus and directness. You'd say very, very powerful, only that that might make people think that it's like a heavy wine. It's certainly not that. Uh, 5,000 to 10,000 vines per hectare planted within Bienenberg, and about 10 hectares of, of the site is uh, classified as GG, all of Huber's parcel is. Um, and this certainly is only, this is the 15, 
And here we are in 2020 in the middle of renewed COVID lockdown. Thank you, Mr. Andrews, um, in Victoria that is. Uh, but here we are in 2015 and it's only just starting to you know, go like that. It's just starting to, to open and evolve. You sort of notice uh, chalky characters, flinty characters almost. Um, but again, I used to come away from these tastings. Um, I remember writing at one point, you start to run out of superlatives, and you really do, because there's just that much charm and finesse and layers of tasting these wines. They're a hell of a lot of joy. And that is one of the best things you can say about the whole lineup, is the amount of pleasure that you actually get from drinking them. It's a bloody treat. So the last wine, uh, Willenstein, as I said, from within the Bienenberg GG, all from within a GG parcel, but because the VDP wine laws prohibit having two GGs from the same vineyard, we've probably been over this a million times, it's not actually classified as a GG, and yet it's the flagship wine in the lineup, it's the top wine in the lineup, if you like. Um, so the Wildstone uh, name comes from the fact that uh, this particular part is walled by old stone walls, as it were, um, set up by the Cistercians way back in the day. And um, it has a really deeply sort of mineral character. Uh, this one is less on, less on the fruit spectrum, more on the stones and earth spectrum. And again, the aging potential is as long as a piece of string, a very long piece of string, but the charm potential or the drinking potential is immediate. Um, just pulled the cork on this Wildenstein about an hour ago, gave it a quick double decant and leaving it sort of open up to see as it evolves. You'll see my thinking there, Sunday afternoon in Kyneton, having a bottle of that to work towards later. Won't be too bad by the fire. Charlie might even get some. Um, but yeah, I mean, put this in a blind lineup. Try it, put it in a blind lineup and, and run through the options. Is it Vone? Is it Nui? Chambon Mazzini? Gevre Chambertin or, or other? And you will get, nine times out of ten, you will have people falling over themselves to ping which, which one in Burgundy it is. Now, is that a good thing? Well, maybe not, you know. But it's more about the fact that the quality is there, the power is there, and the finesse is there, where it doesn't look like it's from somewhere strange. It doesn't look like some second-class citizen. You know how often we've been caught out with an Oregon Pinot looking like Burgundy, a top New Zealand Pinot looking like an Oregon or a Burgundy wine, vice versa. It's all come closer together. And uh, this, um, in fact, I would say equally, these last three, Schlossberg, Bienenberg, Wildenstein, are really where it's at with regards to um, Pinot Noir in Germany. Sure, there's loads of other guys now doing good stuff. It's getting more and more exciting. There's some great producers up in the R. There's other producers. Sarah Logenstein is making a killer wine in the Mosel. Um, but for me, the real excitement of Germany, Pinot, is still Spätburgunder from Baden, never better exemplified than the 2015 set from Julian Huber and Co. Uh, thank you for joining me on another cellar session. I always call it cellar session studio session we know this uh, thank you cheers and look forward to I don't know getting 50 people into a Victorian restaurant at some time soon mr. Andrews please my friend please cheers